How are you doing? Did you have a good lunch? My name is Larry Medeo. It's great to be hosting this um, panel on Africa's smart cities, the cities of the future. And you're going to be hearing from three great people, so let me introduce them straight away. The first on the panel is uh, Patrick Buciana, his CEO of Airclark. Please give him a big round of applause as he comes in. Also joining me is the mayor of the city of Kigali, Fidel Ndaisaba. Please give his worship the mayor a big round of applause as well. And last but not least, Shiletsi Makofane is head of government and industry relations at Ericsson Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you so much for joining us on the panel today. Um, this is kind of a tick for me. It says on that graphic that my name is Madoa with an A. It's got an O at the end, so just putting that out there. I thought, well, looking through this, I'd, I'd give you a definition of what a smart city is, so we know what we're talking about from the outset. And it says a smart city uses digital technologies or information and communication technologies to enhance quality and performance of urban services to reduce costs and, reduce consum and resource consumption and to engage more effectively and actively with its citizens. And one of the interesting things for those of, I live in Nairobi, and my home city of Nairobi was for the second year, this uh, second, second time this year named Africa's most intelligent city. And if you've ever been in Nairobi, it's kind of an odd thing, an odd distinction that Nairobi, with its many, many challenges, traffic not the, the least of them, would be named Africa's most intelligent city. And cities in Africa that seem to be doing so much better don't qualify. But in preparing for this panel, I thought about what a smart city is and what qualifies as a smart city. And I think, in my estimation, any city that's efficient, that's, um, that runs well, that is livable, and that's, can I say awesome, should qualify as a, as a smart city. If it uses ICTs to make citizens', citizens lives easier, whether they need to pay bills, whether they need to get from point A to B, and just make, making sure that their quality of life in that city is something that's worthwhile, that would, be a quali uh, that would qualify for me as a smart city. But I want to ask my panel now to give their own ideas of what smart cities are from where they sit, and also some of them do, and all of them do incredible work around smart cities. I was speaking to Patrick earlier, and I'm fascinated by the work that Air Clark does in the city of Kigali around transport, and we're going to give him five minutes to kind of run us through that real quick. Patrick. Um, thank you. Uh, my description of a smart city is more than just uh, using technology. I think a smart city is not something that you just import um, from another country and uh, bring it here say this has worked in Vienna and have it here. A smart city is something that's built within, um, which is in line with the culture of uh, the people that, uh, the inhabitants of that city. Um, we have a very special story to share as Air Clark because uh, when we started off, we had a product that, um, it's an automatic fare collection system where you have a card that replaces paying cash and getting a paper ticket. So we mount a validator on the bus and then you tap and get moving. Um, so initially when we started with thought it was just a system that you have a card, tap, and go. But we got to understand that it was a lot more, and we got back to the drawing board and had a lot more work to do, and we ran a pilot for about eight months um, just to have the product that we have right now and uh, that we will launch uh, next week to remove cash entirely on the buses. So our system um, majorly focused on having... Uh, the aspect of convenience to the clients, um, and it had to be affordable both for the clients, um, the commuters that are using it, the bus operators, and the government when it comes to building infrastructure on top of it. And I think uh, Shiletsi from Ericsson will talk a lot more about um, supporting the already existing um, AFC system. So, um, and building this whole uh, smart city had, all the key players had um, a role to play. The government, which had to support, and uh, the mayor will be talking about a lot of the support that they're giving uh, to have a smart city being built. Um, the bus operator, we had Kigeli Bus Services with the chairman who's at the forefront of innovation um, supporting, and definitely private companies um, like ourselves that have a big role to play in the investment, in the research and development. So I think a lot has to be done for a smart city to be built. Um, Rwanda has uh, moved a huge step, and uh, we think we'll be key players in building a smart Africa. Um, ourselves, we want to export the product to Ivory Coast, and I think uh, many other services from Ivory Coast can also be um, imported to Rwanda and uh, shared across the region. 
um, and together we, we build what we want to, to uh, the future city that we want to see. Yeah. Okay, we'll hear from the mayor in a moment, but I want to bring in Shiletsi here from Ericsson because you have a unique partnership with the government of Rwanda around smart cities. Okay, thanks very much. Um, before I get into that, uh, let me just reflect a bit on the, how we are viewing this world of the smart cities. Is that if we look on the, we annually do research to be able to understand the changing uh, behaviors and uh, also the going trends. We've got what we call consumer lab. Uh, and then what we have come up with now, we have identified that going forward, and I think I've had a lot of speakers talking uh, during this conference in different way. There, there are new behaviors or that, that are coming up. Um, and then I think there's a whole talk that I've had about uh, moving from uh, education to learning, uh, moving from uh, uh, health to wellness, and, and, and so on and so on. That is kind of revolutionizing how we are seeing things uh, uh, into the future. Uh, and the fact that obviously the generation that is coming up that will be living in the cities in the future uh, would not be seeing borders because obviously they'll be exposed to the global world. They are coming in a time where internet gives them information so they would have the same aspiration uh, as any other people living in any other cities uh, around the world. So, so looking at that, uh, we then uh, having looked on what uh, Africa was looking at at the time, and uh, we transformed Africa that uh, happened last time to be able that adopted the ma manufacturer of Smart Africa. Uh, then we uh, looked into that, and then I think the, the government of Rwanda was way ahead in terms of uh, developing the Smart Rwanda on what they want to do. Um, then from Ericsson perspective, we felt that uh, maybe this is good that we start engaging with the government and seeing what is possible. Um, they obviously understand uh, the local and the, and the citizen in terms of what they're looking for in the long term. Uh, and then uh, together as we look on, we are driving a vision of a network society where we are also saying in future, uh, we are going to see more and more people urbanizing into cities. And then as more and more people urbanizing into cities, taking consideration of those trends that I've mentioned. Um, then you'll see that there becomes a demand of certain things that uh, technology needs to come in and help uh, facilitate opportunities and also uh, help and uh, solve certain challenges that will come up into the future. Um, with that, then we, we started working on, say, obviously, what are the key things that we need to be able to look at. Up to so far, we have looked into the area of, uh, of transport. Um, it's a very important uh, area. I mean. Uh, Obviously, for people to be able to uh, go to work, they need to be transported. Uh, and obviously, when people go to work, that is when the economy grows because of they are able to be productive, uh, create the GDP. So it made sense, obviously, uh, to be able to pick such an area, to be able to say, look into what can be done. Uh, and together uh, with the partners, obviously, we are kind of uh, at the stage where we are trying to reformulate the picture of what uh, it needs to look like. So, so what we have uh, announced with the government of Rwanda is really more of a memorandum of understanding to help us explore. Uh, and then that is exactly what we are doing uh, to be able to say what is going to happen in that. But what I want to add into, into, into broader transport, obviously, um, that as they, as they unfold, I think one of the pressures that the African cities have is that you do have a bit of a high traffic starting to build up. Uh, and, uh, and, and most cities are starting to face that challenge. Um, I think Africa has got an opportunity. Some of the cities, yes, they've reached a very high level of um, uh, traffic congestion, but some of the cities are not yet there. Uh, but it becomes important to be able to look into how to then uh, improve the, the transport system, obviously, uh, with what we are working on helps to be able to reduce the congestion. If we can be able to get people more uh, onto the uh, public transport where it's been shared. Because one of the biggest challenges that we've picked up was the whole lack of information where people does not know where the transport is or when I would get the transport. Uh, you just have to go and wait and hope it will come. And then you also cannot make a request. Uh, and then as an owner of the transport as well, you cannot let the bus run all the time because you're burning fuel, uh, not picking up and not knowing where, at which point you're picking up how many people, where are you making money and that. And I think building IT, 
into that building uh, uh, technology into that starts to give you that information. Uh, and then when it gives you that information, uh, when people also start to interact with that a lot, what's going to happen is going to be rather than if, I, if I'm going to work and I don't need to move around during the day for the meetings and I'll be in the office the whole day, then I rather can be able to take a bus and go to work unless maybe I need to move to areas where during the day I need to, uh, to access them where um, uh, I need a bit of a certain flexibility. But I think going on in this kind of what we are looking at going forward is that uh, we're doing some bit of work in some of the uh, cities but outside uh, uh, Africa where you would also have a multi mode transport ability. With one, uh, with your mobile phone or one charging point, you can get into the bus, you can get into the taxi, you can get into any other mode of the transport in a train, and then be able to reach where you're going. Uh, that. So, so I think that is just one area. Uh, and then I think as the discussion unfold, I'll reflect on some of the areas that are uh, we, we are looking at to be able to touch on, on, the, on around the cities. All right. I'm excited to have the mayor of Kigali here because in my mind, having traveled across Africa, Kigali is one of my ideal cities. It's very well organized, it's safe, it is livable. It's an awesome experience. When you come in here, having come from many other parts of Africa, you kind of feel like this is an African city that is getting it right. And that is a credit to you, Mayor. And I wonder how you do it to try and achieve a, a lot more than many other African cities can do. Fine with a lot more people who live there, but they can't get a quarter of what's happening here. Thank you, and thank you for the credit and uh, compliment. Uh, of course, uh, this is happening uh, not only because of the mayor. Of course, there is the leadership from the top leadership, leadership of the country, the whole nation, and uh, uh, together with the leadership of the city and our people, the private sector mm -hmm. playing a big role, and our residents playing a big role in having a modern and organized city. All right. So as uh, a city uh, which is uh, building itself and growing, uh, it's important uh, to make it and, uh, in an organized manner. And our aim is to have, of course, an intelligent city, which is, uh, of course, uh, smart, clean, and safe. Uh, and uh, a destination of investors, of course, uh, all for that. And um, coming back to uh, intelligent city and smart city, uh, as you know, a city to be smart, uh, it goes with um, a city which is connected, where people are connected. And uh, uh, not only to be connected for the sake of being connected, but uh, to impact positively on livability and workability of people in that city. And uh, this uh, uh, is um, it goes with the lives of uh, residents, communities, the entire private sector, and the public administration, the public service. Uh, we, uh, in public administration, uh, supported by the national government, uh, we are happy to record that every corner of the city of Chigari now is connected with the fiber. Uh, this is uh, an important uh, uh, achievement uh, we build on. And uh, on top of that, we mobilize now our people. And now it is a rule in the city of Chigari. When you build a house uh, with the capacity uh, accommodating more than 100 persons, 100 persons and above, uh, to get the occupation permit, you have to be connected to the fiber. And uh, to achieve this, of course, uh, it cannot be the responsibility of the public administration. We work with the private sector. The telecoms operators are very ac active in that. Uh, actually, it is a business uh, for them. And uh, the government has laid out the backbone infrastructure as fiber. And now, uh, the telecom companies, the internet uh, providers are just connecting house to house. Right. And for those big houses, it is a requirement. You can't get a, an occupation permit now without that. So, uh, this is uh, in terms of infrastructure and connectivity. But uh, there is another thing important to, to follow. 
to have solutions, different solutions, which uh, can help in the life of people. To have data, the content, and to have the open data. Uh, from the perspective of the public administration, we started by ourselves. One of the important services uh, we manage is the construction permitting. We started by the master plan and we digitalized our land. Now, our master plan is georeferenced on digital basis where you can check with your mobile phone the land use of every single parcel in the city of Chigari. So, uh, just sending an SMS. Right. So, uh, that it helps to ease the life of people to have information. We opened that information, working with uh, the Rwanda Natural Resource Authority, managing the land center. We opened the data on land administration, which is registered. The whole land in the city of Chigari is now registered. And uh, in construction permitting, we introduced a system, a construction permitting system, where applications are being handled online. This is, uh, uh, it has made incredible change in terms of delivery uh, for the public service, in terms of fighting uh, against corruption, this is important. We have had several issues before that uh, new system where people are complaining that the applications are lost, they don't find them, they are delaying, and this has contributed uh, a lot to improving the ranking of Rwanda and the city of Chigari in doing business, right. where we have been uh, ranked five years consecutively, uh, number three uh, in whole Africa. So, um, in, uh, uh, also in uh, other perspective, for business perspective, uh, to have solutions like uh, banking system, like uh, utility, utilities, like uh, agencies supplying water and electricity, where you is the life of uh, resident in the city, you can buy electricity from your house using your mobile phone, where you can bank using your, uh, the ICT, your computer or your, just your, your phone, mm -hmm. or even uh, with that connectivity, being able to bank at the ATM, deposit or to uh, withdraw your money. And this is, enough, as a, a city administrator, this uh, is a very and an incredible uh, achievement with that in terms of security. You can imagine uh, before using the IT systems to, to handle the life of people in the city, at five, having people rushing to the banks, uh, just, and closing the business, literally because they don't want to be exposed with money, with the cash. So, and this has uh, uh, really contributed to the cashless transactions in all activities. Now we are working with Rwanda Revenue Authority to uh, even collect taxes uh, where people can just uh, submit their declarations for tax mm -hmm. and pay. Uh, of course, this is a uh, one of the milestones to use the connectivity, to be connected. All right. But uh, there is uh, uh, another uh, important uh, milestone you have to achieve. This is the sustainability uh, and to increase literacy of our people to be able to enjoy okay. so the benefit of ICT in their life. All right. So I'm sure we want to hear your experiences uh, from your cities, whether they're in Africa or beyond some of the pain points. Is it traffic? Is it corruption? Is it uh, maybe the citizens' own attitudes? But before that, I want to just take another round of questions real quick. For Patrick, there was a similar plan in Nairobi to have cashless public transport. A lot of the people in Nairobi 
use public transport for obvious means. And there's even one, one program from Google that was crapped a short while after it was launched. I wonder what the lessons or experiences you have had launching that in Kigali. Um, yes. Um, as I said, whatever product that you have to launch when you talk about smart cities, it has to be tailored towards the culture of people. Um, it doesn't have to be changing the habits. Um, Google was talking about Google Pay. Yes. Um, that is something that is going to change the habits of, of, of Kenyans. Um, already they use M-Pesa. So what we did, um, and, and that I think many uh, banks and uh, Google didn't do in Nairobi, is that we also integrated into the already existing systems. At the moment, you can, uh, we're testing out whereby you can top up our card using your mobile phone from your home. Um, using mobile money, um, all the telecoms, and 12 banks. Um, those are systems that people are already using for paying for electricity, paying for water. So integrating that um, to payment for the card makes it much easier. But then also government policy has a lot to play in um, setting up an automated fare, fare collection um, system and later having an ITS, which is in intelligent transport systems, where the whole transport system is smart. Um, where a situation where you have the bus fares changing in the morning and in the afternoon because it's raining just can't work um, with the AFC. So the government has to play a key role in regulating the transport systems, um, which I think Rwanda did very well uh, way before we started talks of the AFC and the ITS. Um, so I think that also has a role to play. But the bus operators also have to understand that they're losing a lot of money because of um, cash exchanging hands, and they need a system. So they need to organize themselves, um, whereby you know that these buses maybe go into a union, and these are owned by so-and-so, they maybe form a company, which is what we have in Rwanda. So a situation whereby you don't know which bus is on, it, bec it becomes hard to mount your equipment. Yeah. So it, needs, it needs a lot more discipline than in, in, in a system where anybody can put their car on the road. So you, it's hard to track who owns what car and when is it on the road and when is it, not, is it not on the road. So it needs to be some kind of organization around the public transport to start with. Sure. Okay. Um, Shiletsi, I wanted to ask you about the importance of data and understanding the citizens' um, behaviors. When do they usually go to work? What is the typical duration of a commute, ETC, in trying to find a solution for them because if you don't understand the people you're trying to build a smart city for, you might be building a solution, you might be giving a product that nobody will use. So do you need to understand your consumer, do you need to understand your citizen, your resident a lot more before you even begin to craft any of this? I think you have a very good point that you mentioned. I think there's a lot to try to, that you need to understand uh, because obviously as you plan, you need to be able to uh, understand that movement. But a lot of data is already there. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's about uh, data mining. I mean, uh, uh, part of what we are uh, looking at with uh, ITS is uh, obviously with the cloud, you can then be able to um, uh, understand a bit of movement of the vehicles, uh, understand at what point in time, how do you sequence your traffic, mm -hmm. Uh, so that people can be able to move. And then also on the other hand is that if there is a bit where you don't pick movements, then you'd either know is there an accident or is there a fire or is this, then you're able to obviously in a uh, smart city redirect the cameras to be able to pick up what is happening there or dispatch a vehicle to be able to, uh, to go there. So, so mining data becomes uh, very, very critical. Um, and then also the other areas as well is uh, in terms of uh, uh, making sure that uh, in future, you could then be able to predict what are the areas and what times are the uh, movements of the people and then how do we change. I mean, there's a lot of behavioral aspects that are changing into the, uh, into the future. Uh, but I think yeah, starting to put that data mining, uh, making sure that we collect as much data today, I mean, with a mobile phone as you move, mm -hmm. obviously it does give you that. Uh, and then also there are other systems. If you go to our stand, uh, we together, we are working together uh, uh, on, on, uh, on, on some of the areas uh, showcasing. One of the things you'll see there is that the buses move in Kigali, you can re see them real time mm -hmm. uh, on there to say where is the bus, which street is on, uh, and then that gives you obviously a, a big data. If you pick up that data, where the bus stops, if it's, not, if it's supposed to stop for, for a minute, the minute it stops more than a minute then you can be able to pick up and say, is it this becoming a more routine? Are there more people on the stop? Should I plan more time on that? 
or suddenly it stops where it's not supposed to stop, then you're able to pick up, obviously, as a bus company to be able to say, what's happening with my bus? What do I need to, uh, to do? Should I send someone there uh, to be able to investigate what is the issue uh, around this and that? So I think big data analysis is very, uh, is very much important. Uh, and then one of the work that we've been doing with uh, Volvo and, and uh, one of the Korea companies who is a pilot that we, we are doing currently is that we realize most of the people are at work during the day. And then when people order parcels or to be delivered, they want them to be delivered at home. Uh, and then in reality is that parcels can be delivered to your car in future uh, where you don't need to be there by just creating a code uh, security code that will allow someone to have a one access to the vehicle. Um, you could then be able to say, if I've ordered something, want to deliver grocery, or you want to deliver uh, whatever parcels or letters that you need, they could be able to pick up where is your car at that point in time. They know you've got this mail or you've got this parcel. Then they just come to your car, they, they request, and then you generate the code, you send it to them, they come to your car, they open, and then they deliver the parcel, and then you go. So, so that then makes the whole system uh, uh, efficiently. So I think there's so much that can be done around really around integrated uh, uh, transport system. And uh, as I said earlier, transport is a backbone of the economy uh, and it needs to be taken care of uh, to make sure that it continues to drive the GDP. All right, so understanding consumers and uh, behaviors or habits is just one angle of it. The other one is sometimes you need to change consumer behavior or uh, citizens like uh, you're doing mayor in Kigali and getting rid of cars on some streets, which is kind of, so people who like to drive, they're, they're not very happy with that. <laughs> uh, definitely. Uh, you know, uh, the good thing is that, uh, of course, if you introduce new things, it creates shocks. Uh, there is a way to prepare people to manage with, uh, and to mitigate uh, the consequences and uh, the the shocks, but uh, always new things come with uh, some shocks, and uh, we have to deal with that. But uh, as long as it is for the good of people, uh, with time the results mobilize people themselves, so, uh, and. Uh, also, people have to be educated, they have to be accompanied. It is uh, not only uh, resident to be, uh, uh, to change the, uh, the behavior. Uh, also, uh, all users, even uh, ourselves, officials mm -hmm. and uh, uh, government officials and uh, other uh, uh, servants, to, to change. You know, uh, while we are talking about uh, the use of uh, technologies, uh, it is not always easy. Uh, we have uh, uh, witnessed where we introduced some solutions, and mm -hmm. you have people who are reluctant to... So there's some resistance when you yes, introduce certain things. So, yes, and, and uh, you have to be consistent, you have to uh, monitor, and uh, you have to transform people, really, and uh, uh, to change uh, the mentality. It's... Uh, uh, very important. It's not only for residents, but all users. So do you listen to these voices? Sometimes they're yelling at you on social media, telling you you're terrible and you've ruined their lives completely? Uh, no, you know, uh, as long as you don't uh, abuse, uh, <laughs> you, you explain. You, this is, when you are a leader, you, you, you have to be ready for all those things. Me, uh, as a, a city leader, I like comments. Okay. Because the comments, uh, when they are relevant, they help you to improve. And uh, when they're not relevant, they help you to explain, yeah. All right, so let's hear from the audience. I wonder if you have any thoughts about um, how we can transform African cities into smart cities, whether it's use of different technologies, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, um, unmanned aerial vehicles, ETC, or any experiences for that matter from whatever cities you come from. If you've got any questions, just raise your hand or a comment, and we'll get a mic to you. There's a lady there, please stand, introduce yourself. Being here, Morgan Simon from the US. Um, I'm curious the question around um, sometimes making the choice to reject a technology. So I'm, I'm sure people in the room are much more well versed with um, the plastic bag ban, mm -hmm. and that being the idea of a technology that was introduced that was determined to not be productive and therefore putting a limit 
um, and curious if there's other technologies that you might say no to and what's the citizen reaction to that? All right, because Rwanda is one of the countries that got rid of plastic bags and in many of the African cities, it's perhaps been suggested it didn't work. Mm. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, uh, in the choice of technology and uh, any other policies, uh, it is always uh, good to go uh, by demand driven, not by supply driven. So, uh, what you need and uh, what is useful for you. And uh, when you understand that, now you can define clearly uh, what you want, because outside here, there are many technologies, uh, variable technologies. Uh, when you are influenced by the supply uh, side, you can uh, find yourself uh, wrong, or even uh, losing time and money and resources. So uh, it's uh, important, first of all, to uh, understand the needs, the problem for which you want solutions, and you define, and then you approach people with technologies to find uh, right technologies. All right. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? There's a lady here. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Maya, and I'm also originally from Burundi. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, smart cities, particularly um, things to do with security, enhancing security using ICT and using um, digital transformation. We know that in some African countries, including Burundi, <clears throat> some people are still living in, you know, in, in cities that are not very safe, be it um, from just theft or terrorism and, and all those dangers. How as um, uh, the city council, even in different countries, have we use ICT to be able to promote or enhance security in different countries that are also, you know, struggling with the issue of security. Thank oh, you. Okay. I'm sure she lets you have something to say about that. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question. I mean, uh, that's one of the things that with uh, urbanization becomes a major thing that uh, uh, city managers, city uh, leaders are, are worried about. Uh, and I think if you look on uh, some of the cities, I think we, we've done some bit of work on uh, connectivity with the uh, city of Johannesburg. Uh, but more, and what the cities do on top of that, obviously they, they put uh, the systems that, uh, like your cameras, uh, that can be able to monitor certain hotspots. Um, I think if you look on majority of the time, you had this uh, a bit of crime happening in city centers. Uh, that's one of the challenges that uh, Joburg faced at some point. And since when they installed the cameras, uh, and they have kind of really reduced very, very high the crime rate that they had, and then very, very safe city now. Uh, because what that gives you is that they are able to see the incidences because those cameras, they've reported to the control center, they have been monitored, uh, and then when there's an incident, that most of the times they're even able to respond to it before that person can even uh, report. Uh, because, I mean, can you imagine if somebody uh, uh, steals from you a cell phone, how do you report now? Because you don't have a tool. You have to now walk around and go and find ways, the police station, to be able to report. Uh, and then I've seen some number of uh, cases where they were showing on TV where they are able to help people uh, where they arrest uh, in this kind of instances. And I think with that level of publicity, they've kind of uh, help them to be able to drop down because people know that when you get into the city now you're not just walking you have been watched there are certain uh, areas as well that have been watched if you look on also what they've, they've been using as well is around the the, the main roads uh, that also got technology that is able to send uh, and also video feeds that is able to tell them uh, what's happening on the roads and then sometimes obviously when they are um, uh, accidents that are kind of fatal that close your main arterial roads, uh, you might not be able to even dispatch an ambulance to that particular point. So somebody has to be able to make an assessment and say based on the nature of this, there's no way you'll get an emergency there without having to dispatch a helicopter or do something or that. So I think the, the, the cities are kind of uh, uh, looking to that and also at, uh, from what uh, we are doing as well as uh, Ericsson in other areas as well, uh, you have got a number of sensor points that you are able to pull, obviously, and pull the data that could be able to give you 
uh, with various sensors in the cities to be able to understand where are your high risks, uh, what is the changes in the temperatures in the different areas, so that you could be able to detect is there fire or could it be that. So uh, there's a lot of really coming back to that point of big data. Once you put the cameras and the relevant technology of sensors, then you're able to know at what point is my city behaving normal. And then at what point when there's a change is my city not behaving uh, normal. And then the other thing as well that we should not undermine as well is that the whole issue of putting as well the whole sensors into understanding and measuring the waters as they move because those are very important points of what people uh, consume. They are very important for the city. As you urbanize, you don't want to be caught up in an outbreak or something that could be harmful to the majority of the city. So you'd see a lot of that of deploying sensors into that. Uh, and then therefore you always know the quality of the water that is flowing to the citizens okay. uh, at any, any point in time. So then you are able to keep the citizens safe. If there's something that you pick up as a problem, then you are able to, to react to that uh, quickly. Just on security, mayors, before you answer, I wonder what, um, if the cameras alone are a deterrent in itself, and if that therefore can replace actual show of force, which is having men with guns on the street, so that you know if you, if you get into trouble, somebody's gonna get you. Sure, uh, you know, uh, in terms of security, you have to look for uh, prevention and also intervention or response. So, uh, and uh, uh, definitely uh, one can assist another, but uh, cameras don't intervene. Right. But they help to detect, to do surveillance, but you will need, uh, in a way, some deployment to intervene where necessary. This is where uh, you, you, you need the uh, armed forces or other security organs to be around deployed to, to take action where necessary. So, uh, uh, but uh, in the, that direction, uh, also ICT uh, may assist uh, in different ways of interventions. Uh, you can imagine the time before uh, telephone, how to call if you are attacked. But now with the technology, and uh, it uh, contributes to the prevention because sometimes uh, criminals don't act because they have fear. It's important when you, you manage security to increase the level of fear of criminals. This is uh, the success of, of yourself. So, uh, they have the fear that if they attack or if they abuse, intervention will be quick because of the technology. People will call, people will communicate, communication. And uh, uh, with the uh, GIS system, it is easy now to find, to find where the scene of the crime is happening. And, uh, uh, have a quick response. Using uh, uh, ICT also uh, in uh, other uh, way of life of, pe uh, of people, uh, especially in the cities, helps to, to prevent, you know, if you move with, uh, uh, with money, this is what I have been saying, it attacks criminals. But if you can have cashless transactions, it helps to prevent. If you are sure that with the sensors, with the uh, cameras, as you said, you will be able to detect, to store information based on the policy you have. You should have, of course, a good policy of managing information. It's good to have data. The cameras and the sensors can help you to have data, but uh, how to keep them, how to analyze them, that is important uh, to play the big role in terms of prevention and, uh, of course, intervention. All right. Yeah. We'll take a few more questions from the audience, if there are any. Good afternoon. All of you have mentioned so far that it's really important to consider um, the market of people that are going to be using these smart products. I would like to hear more about your recommendations for how to get the public more involved in actually co-designing these smart tools and um, policies that you want to implement in order to transform cities into smart cities. 
Okay, um, uh, Patrick, can you handle that so that you're not designing something that does not involve um, does not involve the people that are going to be using it? Um, I think the most common way um, that everyone uses is interacting um, with the clients. Um, but aside from that, you have to know um, the patterns that your clients are using at the moment before you bring whatever system you have to bring. Um, find a way of integrating what you can integrate um, and what you can leave out. Make sure it's something that they can do without. Um, then from there, you have a product put out there. Um, but the product that you put out there should not be the final. It should be a product that is scalable, that it's very easy and flexible to change time and again. Um, because as more and more technologies come into play, you yourself have to open up um, your system to be able to accept um, systems that could have otherwise been competitors to be able to work with you and you to work with them. So um, yourself as the person, as the company that has invested in the business um, has a significant role to play, but the clients as well um, have to be able to keep interacting. Um, and when in era where we have social media platforms, um, websites where someone can send comments, so I think it also um, helps a lot. Yeah. All right. I wonder if from any of you on the panel, if is it possible to transform Africa's current cities into smart cities, or do, should we just move away from the Lagoses and the Hararis and Kairos of this world and build completely new cities from scratch so we can put into, uh, in, in all these smart tools we expect? Is it possible when you have a city the size of Lagos, for instance, if you were to try and make this a bit more efficient, a bit faster, a bit more livable, where do you start? I think just if I will comment on that one is that I think the, 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 the smart cities obviously, um, as uh, the mayor said, it, it, it needs to start with a vision. I think once then you have set the vision, then you need to set, set uh, the say what are the base I need to put in place to be able to move towards that. Um, you will not be able to achieve that at once. Uh, obviously it's a massive project to be able to get there. Uh, fully to be a smart in everything and the, and the world and the technology evolves. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's, it's, it's identifying the points and saying um, as, as what are the basic infrastructure I need to put in place, how do I need to, to move on with that? And then I mean talking from an ICT, the other things are that obviously the, uh, the city managers will be worried about. But from an ICT perspective, obviously you'd say uh, if I have a base connectivity that can be able to reach the different parts of the city. That starts to give you an opportunity now to be able to say, what are the opportunities or the challenges I need to solve? If I need to then be able to uh, connect uh, health centers so that then uh, people, not everyone needs to move to, the, to go to the health center, mm -hmm. then you can do that. Because I mean, sometimes there are, there are people that are, are old age people that uh, sometimes they, they uh, do you really need them to come to the old center if it's not really necessary. I think we just saw uh, this morning one of the Dogtown call apps. So those are the kind of things in a city that you could deploy. People could be able to call and then be able to get and say, okay, do I need to go to that doctor or not? Do I don't need to go to, 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 go to that doctor physically. Um, and then the other things as well is that uh, around issues of energy, we've got a major issue of energy in Africa. Uh, one of the critical things, uh, the same as we talk on transport has been critical, Energy is very critical. I mean, if you then look into smart metering, uh, ma managing those uh, microgrids, uh, and starting to allow other injections through smart grids, smart metering, then there are two things that we are starting to facilitate. Number one, you start to inform the users. And I've seen a number of studies where once people start to know what they are using at what time, uh, and some of the devices that are taking a lot of energy, the behavior changes. The problem is that today is that people receive the bills after a month or two months. I mean, then they've used already. So they never show at what point in time is what they're using that they could be able to do away with. So there's no information really. Through ICT, on smart metering, you can give them a very good intelligent information. And then if the person wants to cut down their bill, because they can see the real time when the bill moves, then they know how to manage their costs down. And then that helps to save energy. And then we are able to also can be able to supply more people with uh, with energy. And then around the grids as well, we are starting to see Africa has been said to be having a, a lot of sun time. 
Uh, therefore, as you allow more people to be able to have solar energies, other sorts of generations, if it's the industries and that. So once you've integrated ICT, then you're able to tell them when they are at work, uh, the amount of solar that is, I guess, is generated could probably feed back to be able to supply other industries. Uh, and then through, obviously, ICT, you can facilitate that. And then other industries, obviously, when uh, they are generating excess as well, they can be able to put back into the main grid and then be able to supply the people. And then during the evening, also, you can work with the dynamic tariffing, uh, where you know that if I need to change the behavior, because sometimes the point you talked about earlier, uh, it's information will change the behavior of the people. If you are picking up a stress as a city on supplying energy at a particular point in time, you could then do what we call dynamic tariffing. I mean, that we have seen in the telcos that uh, has been there uh, where you had a different rate for the day and a different rate for the night. And basically it was because of uh, during the day you have, a, you have to dimension your network, big resources, but during the night they are, useless, they are not being used much. Then why not allow that to be able to uh, to use in, into that. So I think it's those kind of models that the city can start a bit by bit, and they are appealing to the, to the, uh, to the users. And I mean, if you look on education as well, um, I, I happen to see some innovation where sometimes most of our special, uh, uh, what do you call special kids, sometimes we call them disabled, but I guess we prefer to call them special, is that sometimes they don't get access to certain facilities and certain uh, education because they cannot be able to move there. Uh, and then through ICT, if you've got that ICT in a city, uh, the robotic world has developed so much and the, now with the cameras, it means that the, the kid at, can sit at home and then can be able to interact uh, as if they are at the classroom at school. So, so it helps you then to start, once we bring out those cases, I think then the, the behavior start to change and then we can be able to make an impact on the cities. I think the case is there. Uh, but it's just to build and then be able to make sure that we take step by step and, and, and uh, uh, build towards a, a, a smarter city and a smarter Africa. And I think we will be able to get there. All right, Mayor, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I think as uh, said, uh, um, uh, uh, the only thing I would add is that uh, um, different factors of production then uh, of economic growth uh, have limited ability to keep the growth. There is one which has no limitations. This is technology. Uh, 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 cities, we have to embrace it and to use it for a better life of uh, citizens of our cities. Uh, this is the only thing I can add to what he said. Yeah. All right, I think I have room for a few more questions before we have to wrap up the panel, so we'll take one from there. Please get a mic in. Just raise your hand so they can see you. Thank you. My name is Moses Turatsinze. I work for the Rwanda Development Board, the ICT department. Um, the reality is, everything smart is costly. I've been reading a report about how Americans, when they grow old, they take all their investments and money to go and enjoy it in the Philippines, in Manila, because some of these cities are they are not costly to live in. I have a concern. Maybe let me put this to the panelists to comment. Um, as we modernize, as we computerize, to make life easier for those who can afford, can we think of inclusion? Because you cannot stop the realities of rural urban migration. As decision makers, as strategists, as people who decide on solutions, how can we factor in the issue of the cost of access to these technologies? Th that's why I have a concern that uh, the planning looks at availing the services, easing the processes, but the cost of access by the population, the city dwellers, is, the cost of is an issue. Okay, is the cost of access always high? Like Patrick's solution, for instance, is almost um, 
um, the cost is almost negligible at, at, at the beginning, isn't it? Okay. I'm worried that in Africa, as we modernize, as we do this, we might end up with cities that are costed to live in. And I, I would want to bring that... So the, to basically you're that. saying they will be too expensive that the ordinary citizen cannot afford to live in that city? Exactly. Because of all these smart solutions? Yes. Okay, I see. Okay. What um, are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's Thank very, very interesting, I think, because with Ericsson, we've been having that discussion um, for over two months now. Um, so, first of all, um, as I said, the technology that we wanted to provide to the government and to the commuters should not be costly. It mm -hmm. should um, encompass everyone, even to the last man. So, what we did was we brought a system to bus operators that were losing about 30% of their revenues. So, we're bringing a solution that is helping them recap that revenue. So what we do is we find a percentage that is much less than what they were losing and help them recap. So they're making more money than they were making even... Um, what about for the consumer? Does so it the cost consumers, them more? we don't charge them anything. Okay. Um, when it comes to the mobile app of Topping Up and many other mobile applications that are being used um, um, to enable uh, smart usage for the users, always try not to target um, the end user. Um, we go so low that we um, even make sure that any mobile application that we are forming is, has a USSD component onto it. USSD is being able to use it on a feature phone. So if you don't have a smartphone, you can still use the service? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. If you have, and uh, um, Ericsson is also actually also showcasing one of their solutions um, using USSD. So um, you have to think very, very, very hard on uh, the solutions that you're bringing. Um, which is what um, we did, and uh, I think many other markets should also learn the same. All right. Yeah. Mayor, is that a concern for you that you might have so many excellent smart solutions but too expensive for the ordinary citizen? Or how do you balance those two? Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is where um, innovation uh, have to chip in and uh, bring more solutions uh, to reach affordability. Yeah, uh, it's important uh, for uh, people in the field of uh, IT solutions, being the, uh, the hard and the soft uh, side of it, uh, there is an important uh, role to play. And uh, the role of the government and is to create an environment which is uh, giving more uh, opportunities to different players to come. Uh, I, I remember, for instance, the time we started the mobile phone, to use the mobile phone in Rwanda, having just one company, how the cost was. For the handset and the service itself. But uh, opening it to the competition, uh, bringing on board the more players, it has tremendously reduced the cost. So, uh, there's this uh, role to be played by the government to create that environment, uh, and also to facilitate innovations okay. and uh, uh, education. Uh, to, because people to be smart, they have to be equipped, not only with uh, tools, but also skills. When you have good skills, you can have more innovative ideas and self reliable and at the same time, you can uh, use efficiently and make efficient choices of technologies and tools you use. Because uh, you can find, for instance, uh, people using different gadgets unnecessarily. While with one gadget, you can handle multiple functions. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the cost real quick, Shlesi? Yeah, I think uh, on that one, obviously, one of the things that we have to understand uh, or take into consideration is that um, if you introduce or do anything that uh, does not create returns for the for the private sector, does not create benefits for the for the public sector, then that normally is not sustainable. Um, some of the things that I think we, we need to consider is the, uh, to be able to create a, obviously a, a, a bankable business case, you, you need to get 
uh, the, some of the right volumes uh, needs to be thought through on how you structure, how you get the volumes, depending on what, what, what areas you, you want to focus on, but that becomes important. Um, and then the fact that the other factor as well, uh, which is important, is about the predictability. Um, and obviously, the, uh, sometimes if it's very difficult to predict how the environment will change and that, then you're likely to see uh, financiers uh, pricing more risks into the business case. Uh, and then when they price more risks in the business case, then it means uh, ultimately what comes out uh, becomes a little bit of a uh, pricey. So I think those are the kind of things, if we know we are going to create smart cities in Africa, we know we are going to be smart. We are not, we are not going to be in there for a short haul. We are going to be in there for a long haul. Therefore, the thinking needs to take that into consideration that we are in this for a long haul. As we partner, as we make technology choices, uh, then we need to be able to think those things from a long-term perspective. Uh, so that then you can be able to uh, reduce your curve uh, of how the, the cost gets spread and then you're making it more and more affordable to the, to the citizen. I think every business uh, and, and, and uh, every government as well, the issue of affordability, it is on the, on the mind because obviously you don't want to provide something is restricted to few, but you want to provide something that uh, can be able to grow uh, and then can be able to create, uh, create returns. I would say it's a very important that point that you raised, but I guess getting that equation right uh, is not easy. If it was uh, such an easy thing, I think you will not be having business that goes out of business or uh, business cases that are failing. But, but I would kind of at a simple principle level put those things into, uh, into perspective. And then I think the point that the mayor mentioned, technology choices are very important. I think it's, uh, there are so many things. I mean, it's not to say uh, you need to know how to choose, you know, that's the first thing. Uh, because if you don't know how to choose, then you might find yourself aiming to make a choice among the wrong stuff. So, so you still have to make a choice, but, but there are a certain level of where you need to know uh, what are the mainstream things, what are the things that I need to encourage, what are the things that will give me a long-term uh, uh, life cycle of, of what, you are, what you're investing in. Okay. Um, we only have room for maybe one or two more questions before we have to wrap up the panel, so if there are any. This would be a good time. Yes, sir, and you. Um, is there any, because I'm gonna take them together so we can answer them as we wrap up. So we'll take these two, okay. Uh, hi, my name's uh, Josh Whale from Ampersand. Um, I'd like to ask the panel if there are particular transport modalities, types of vehicles that are preferred in the region. Um, so uh, the Boda Bodas and Motos of, of Kigali are a, have been a huge boom in the last few years, and I've, I think we all know there are pros and cons to these vehicles. There are, I think, 500,000 now um, Boda Bodas in Kenya, uh, 100,000 in Rwanda, 22,000 here in Kigali. Um, and my company and my co-founders uh, from Rwanda here are developing solar charged electric uh, versions of these vehicles adapted from China, a uh, hybrid of Chinese and German engineering. But what I would like to know is whether that type of vehicle is um, is something that could fit within these, uh, this vision of the future, or whether a move to more European style buses and subways and other types of transport modalities are preferred. So is there room for a solar charged electric motor, um, motorbike? Yeah, yeah, so these look exactly like uh, the normal motos, except they have a battery and an electric motor, and they're cheaper uh, than the conventional motos, cheaper to run off solar, uh, and they're connected and smarter. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful, he says. That was a question at the back there, so let's get that in as well so we can answer them together. Just raise your hand so they can see you. Yes, there. Okay, my name is Mark. One of the questions already answered, uh, asked for you, but maybe another question is about, you talked about before about the plastic bags in Rwanda. I know about the solar is that there's another issue. But I'm working for a company, we are dealing with environmental issues. Also here in Rwanda, we are trying to do that. But I was um, asking about smart cities. I think it is not costly. It is the law how the government and other people want to do. Because we, if you look in US and others in Europe, governments and people, they just play a role that we want smart cities not thinking about costing. So why are we talking about costing, costing, costing? Because you can start cleaning your home. And if you throw a battery in the wrong place, 
you are spoiling your city. So you have to start home. We should start teaching our kids, our generations, how to do it. So I think leaders should start emphasizing the information that you should start home. That's my question. My All right, so here's the thing. We've got five minutes left, so I'm going to start from the end. If you want to answer any of the questions as you make your closing remarks, and then we'll come around this way. Patrick? Can we get his mic on? Uh, yeah. Um, as I said earlier, just answering the question of the, uh, the solar charged um, vehicles. As I said earlier, our, most of our technology, at least the software end, is inbuilt um, in house. So, what we try to do um, is always open it up, as I said much earlier. Um, and if there's a, if part of the systems that are running the solar vehicle are not integrated in ours, then we're glad to learn from that and you know, find a way of integrating. So I think um, many of the uh, software and smart solutions that the city of Kigali buys as well um, have that um, in common with us. So I think it's, it's up for you to now move to the different key players in building a smart um, city, approach them and see how you can have the integration moving because I think a smart motto integrated into uh, payment systems would be fantastic. Um, and uh, just uh, concluding remarks, um, I think uh, all the players that I talked about, government, private sector, and the, com the commuters who are clients in other cases have a huge role to play in building smart cities. Um, different cities have different cultures, so you just can't import and expect something to work magically. Um, and uh, finally, maybe just to show you one of the products that we did um, um, for the Transform Africa, the delegates that are using hotels um, enjoyed using the smart card uh, on the bus from the hotels to uh, the venue, from the venue to the hotels and to the airport. Um, and we've gotten a lot of positive feedback because then we can know who's still in the hotel, who's um, at the venue, and be able to route the buses to pick up um, whoever is left behind. Um, and uh, yeah, so in uh, my final remarks, I think much as innovation um, has a huge role to play in building smart cities, I think the youth also have a huge role to play in innovation. So youth um, for smart cities. All right, thank you so much. Um, Shiletsi? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I'm encouraged to hear about the back. I'll say we have got this vision on Network Society that we are saying anything that will benefit from being connected will be connected. And I think uh, glad to hear these uh, innovations that is taking place. Um, just on my uh, concluding remarks is that uh, uh, I think the, the, we are getting there as a world to be able to uh, have smart uh, cities in Africa and also have a smart Africa. Uh, I think it's starting small step by small steps uh, and then also making sure that whatever we put on the ground uh, becomes sustainable. Um, we have started those steps uh, as Ericsson and uh, we, we are demonstrating some of the things that we are able to do. I mean, those are the not exhaustive, and I think coming to the point mentioned, you always have to react to the local situation. But I think that our stand there will give you a basic understanding of what really um, uh, smart city we are talking about. Like, so when you talk about the transport, uh, you'll see some of the things that uh, you're able to see, smart bus station, uh, how we are able to now currently show you how the buses are moving, where they are, kind of things that I talked about. Uh, we also show you on the energy, and then the other key thing as well, I think that has, uh, has been talked about as well, is uh, the whole cashless society. And uh, I think the minister said yesterday that uh, maybe the next generation uh, would be surprised why we we carrying coins and uh, notes in our pockets. Right. Uh, and, uh, and I think we are there. We are demonstrating some cases around the future of what um, the whole money would look like in the, uh, in the future. And okay. uh, as you know, there's more mobile phones than anything else. Uh, let's utilize that 
tool and then also as we get other devices connected, then how do we embed all the technologies into it to make the continent smart? All right, and um, Mayor, as you finish, do you have room for um, solar charged electric motors in this city of Kigali? Absolutely. Uh, in the city yeah. of Chigari, we are open to any uh, technology which can uh, improve uh, life of people, which can bring more efficiency. As long as it is bringing efficiency, uh, it is welcome in the city of Chigari. So, um, as the leader of the city, I wish to, first of all, to uh, congratulate all participants here present and uh, uh, to thank you for having contributed to Smart Chigari. Thank you for making uh, Chigari smart, being with us uh, in these uh, important reflections on how we can transform our Africa and our cities. And uh, please stay connected uh, to Chigari and uh, we want to remain connected to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have been an excellent panel. Please give them a big round of applause for um, such an engaging conversation. I want to leave it there. I, was, uh, I have no more, nothing more to add to this. I think they've summarized it excellently because we are uh, trying to make sure we're done by 4 p.m. because uh, they have requested the organizers that everybody head back to the Akagera Maki and there's going to be a keynote address by the First Lady of the Republic of Rwanda, Mrs. Jeanette Kagame. So if you could kindly make your way back to the Akagera Maki for her keynote on digital inclusion for women's empowerment, that would be really great. Have a good afternoon. My name is Larry Mitoho.